Welcome everybody to Victory Circle Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Wilson. Today we have Gretchen Skalka. She's the owner of Career Insights Consulting, and she does career strategy, leadership development, and personal evolution for women who need help with their careers. She helps them with authenticity and power so that they can increase their income, expand their professional influence, and create opportunities for others. Welcome to the show, Gretchen. Thanks for having me, Jason. This is great. (laughs) You're welcome. Gretchen, how does your story start? What did you want to be when you grew up? Oh, wow. Uh, So when I was really little, I actually wanted to be a veterinarian and a professional dog handler. (laughs) Really? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. It's just something that I really wanted to do. My mom did it. And um, I thought that's what I was going to do. And I I was actually in college for that, but I was attacked by a dog in 87. So I changed my plans. Um, That definitely changed that. So I decided to go into journalism because I love people, I love stories, I love learning about people's stories. So that just seemed like a natural next thing. And it was really kind of prescient because it set the stage for everything I would do after that. So from journalism, when you know, every, when the internet was first coming around, like I started working online in, in 96. So I'm one of those like old timers. Right. But that was back when nobody was leaving newspapers. It was like, no, no. And even like my bosses were like, Oh, we, this, when this internet fad doesn't work out, you can always come back to the newspaper. And of course we know where we are today. Right. So, but I, you know, it sort of led me into journalism, led me into sports journalism, which was CBS sports line or sports line USA incorporated at the time. And that's when I made my foray into marketing. And so from journalism into marketing, still telling telling stories, but now we're into brand stories. And it was really through my work in marketing that I began to realize that developing people is really where I wanted to be. I loved it. And so as I got further into my career and moved into my first leadership position, I found that I just really love developing other people into and supporting them to be what they were meant to become, which you really, nobody can know. You can't set that in stone. It's got to happen organically. And so kind of tapping into their potential, their passion, all those things, but really identifying, you know, what their, what their skills are and how to support growth there. So I just started getting into that and I started coaching uh, in 2009. And while I was working my corporate careers, obviously, um, been doing it ever since, but never intended that to be like more than something that I did to support people, you know, while I worked my corporate job. But like a lot of people, you know, the 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 pandemic, the change in uh, everything kind of really what it did for me was it made me appreciate time freedom in a way I hadn't before. And so when it wasn't really about what to do or not to do. It was time freedom, you know, having that ability to have more choice with my own personal time. And when things started to open up, I realized that I I didn't want to lose that, but how was I going to to create that? I had no idea what I was going to do, Jason. And so I did decide to leave my, my corporate career. Uh, You know, I was a marketing director for a long time for the last 10 and a half years. I was working at a huge company Really? And I loved it. I built, yeah, um, I, TBC Corporation. And so I built a great team, content and creative services. It didn't exist before I got there. And I built it up. I hired every single person on the team. I developed them. And we were able to basically create a full stack, if you want to use that term, marketing agency within the marketing department. So we could do everything in content and creative services from, you know, 3D animation and video production all the way to organic and original content, you know, creation. So I, I loved it. And I loved just all the people, obviously, because they were, this is my team. But I knew that, you know, a couple of things. One, I I really knew that there was something else that I needed to do, but I had no clue what it was. And two, I knew that that team was in really good hands because I absolutely knew the person that I wanted to turn it over to. And TBC was a wonderful company because they allowed me to do that. The freedom to basically say, this is the person that I have, you know, a lot of corporations will talk about success planning, succession planning, but they don't implement it. Well, TBC did. And so that team is, is thriving today. And I love that because of the person who, who I was allowed to basically train, right. And develop into a phenomenal 
people leader that she is today. Um, so I love that. And when I was still trying to figure out what I really wanted to do, you know, that would sort of preserve that time freedom and give me the opportunity to serve other people, what did that look like? So I have a client that I've worked with for a while and we were, you know, talking and she said, you know, you should do this. And I was like, do what? And she goes, this, this, this coaching. She goes, you know, for so long I've worked with you, but I could only, we could only talk after work at night on the weekends. Cause we, you know, we're both working, but you, you could do this now. And I thought, well, I've never done it full time. I have no idea if I should do that. I'm not an right. online business person. Can I do this? Is this allowed? So, <laughs> you know, so I thought, well, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. And so I opened uh, Career Insights in April of 2022. And so here we are. And I am so grateful that I have had the opportunity to do it. Never would have thought it would have been something that I would have done, but I, it feels like the most natural thing to do of everything. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously to leave a company like that and start your own business. Okay. You, you've got to be a risk taker. And no, you have, that's it. Th I'm not. No. You're not. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. And I will say this. I think I've always wanted to own my own business. I know that when I was still at Sportsline and this was, I mean, I started Sportsline in 96 and CBS bought them in 2004. So this would have been like in the late 90s. I actually came up with a business plan. I knew I wasn't going to be obviously a veterinarian or a professional dog handler, but I had my first dog after the dog attack and I he had terrible allergies. So I would make his food and I thought I can open a dog bakery and I want to do this. And I knew what I was going to call it. Bon Appetit Bakery. I knew what I was going to do. I took a classes dog from the bakery. Yeah, I know. I know. Well, <laughs> I was making his stuff and I thought, well, I could do this. And so I did some research and it's a, it's a huge industry. A lot of people were very interested in that kind of thing. And I thought, okay, I can do this. So I took classes from the small business administration and I was working on a grant. I was going to go all in, but I'm not a risk taker, Jason, because I looked at like Chris was still in, he, I think he was just going into high school at the time. And like, it just really, it didn't seem like the kind of time to take a risk, right? A financial risk of opening a business at that time. I didn't want to jeopardize anything that was going on uh, with the family. So I didn't do it. And I instantly regretted it. And I've kicked myself in the butt for it for years because I really wanted to do it. And so many people my whole life have said, you know, you'd be great if you were you like your own like thing, did your own, you were your own boss. And I was like, yeah, but yeah, but. And then after a while, you know, life, I've, I've said this before, you know, life has that, there's that phrase where, you know, it'll, it'll toss you a feather and then a pebble and then a rock and then a boulder. And I think you and I have talked about that. And I got a few feathers, got a few pebbles. And then I had like a constant stream of like four years of boulders, big, 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 heavy things and really not, not good or easy things. And the, what that taught me was that whole, yeah, but not now. Oh no, now now do it now. <laughs> so I started doing that little by little, the thing I wanted to do, whatever it was, I started doing it. And that just sort of gave me confidence to do more and to basically help other people, you know, who are like, well, I I'd love to do that, but no, stay with, I'd love to do that. How, when, you know, all that kind of stuff. So that really has, has helped, but no, I don't think I came into this world as a risk taker. <laughs> No. <laughs> well, looking back on this situation, I mean, you, you are where you are right now, but would you go back and start that business? Knowing what I know now about all the years of regretting not doing it. Yes, you would. I would. I would. But, you know, we don't, uh, you know, what's it's interesting that we, the, the hindsight part of it, learning all of that, but I would, unfortunately, you have to go through all that learning experience to understand why you would go back to do it. But oh, no, oh, no. Yeah, I would. Is that still something that you would want to do in the future? A dog bakery? Yeah. I do think about it. I do because I just, think you know, like it's not a secret. Like Newman, I have a dog now. I've had two dogs since the dog attack and they were 12 years apart in getting them. So the first one, it was really difficult because I was very afraid of dogs, but he was a golden retriever and, you know, they have the most affable personality. And so- I thought, okay, he was 13 when, when he passed and I just wasn't ready for another dog. And so when I was ready, 
Newman came home and I'm a little nuts for Newman. I love this kid, but that's the reason why he's only the second one I've been able to. And I grew up on a farm with animals. So it was very odd for me not to have any. Right. But, but I would, I would love it because I just think it's such a fun atmosphere. And I like being around, I like being around animals, especially dogs, because they don't have those kind of, I can't tendencies that, that, you know, adult people kind of tend to have kids don't have that either you know they just go for it you know they could they learn their lessons that way that's how we learn but they go for the thing they do it and yeah I think that would be fun to be around so I think it'd be a fun a fun business to have yeah. it sounds like it but I mean how does that work though a dog bakery I've never heard of that before today <laughs> yeah so there there actually was a franchise that is called the Bone Appetite Bakery and what they do is they have different kinds of, of treats, but they also have uh, the apparatus where you can actually make your own. So I would, when my first, when I had my first golden, he had skin allergies, like a lot of goldens do. And so I would make his food. My mom helped me kind of figure out what would be good in terms of, of giving him from, you know, the protein, the meat, and then vegetables and things like that. And then putting it all together, I would make like this little, almost like a meatloaf for him. And it was really good and it helped him out a lot. And so I thought, well, you know, you can also make little treats and cookies and other things. And there's all kinds of stuff you can make. And I don't know why I can't cook for people, but I was really good at that. <laughs> really? So I thought, well, yeah. So I thought, well, that'd be fun, you know, and there are a lot of dog bakeries now. It, it's interesting where I did my research, where I was going to open my business, there was nothing there at the time, but I knew that there were plans for expansion, all the demographics, you know, the census Im you know, information pointed to everything moving toward Wellington, Florida. And so that's where I was going to go. There was nothing there, but within a few years, the Wellington Green Mall opened. And then there was a dog bakery there. I didn't open mine, but Wolfgang, Wolfgang Bakery opened there. And they're still there today. And so it, it's a, it is a thing now, but it wasn't at the time. At the time, it was largely unheard of. But my mom, because she did... She was a handler and then she opened, uh, she had dog daycare. She was a, she was a canine behavior therapist. My mom did do that. And so, but that was the space that she operated in. She knew someone in Birmingham where, where I grew up, Alabama, who had one. Nobody else had a dog bakery. And I was like, that's the coolest thing. I want to do that. So <laughs> I did, I, I do think about it. I do. Cause they're just fun places to go into and look around. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this, Gretchen. Um, you were attacked by a dog, and I was attacked by a dog too when I was a kid, and that yeah. can, that can be very traumatic, right? Yes, yes. Um, I mean, what kind of dog was that? It was an Akita, and it was at a dog show in Columbus, Georgia, and it was two days after Thanksgiving, nineteen eighty-seven, and I was working for a handler at the time, and so I would I was his help, so I would go and help get everything ready, and then we would go to the show, and I would groom. And then I would bring the dog to the ring and my boss would come out from wherever he was with the dog that he had just shown. And we would switch and I would bring that one back and, you know, exercise them and put them away. And this particular day I had gotten bucks ready and we're standing outside the ring and he starts growling at another dog. And Akitas are very territorial. They're the samurai dog. Very, very, like very territorial, but they're beautiful. I mean, they're just, they're gorgeous. And so anyway, they can be friendly. This one was not. And I kind of just, I did what I was, what I was trained to do, which was, you know, you get down on, on eye level and you just say no and that lead tap the chin. He didn't like that. And I just remember everything in slow motion after that. I remember that head kind of turning and, and then I just remember running and I'm running, running, running. I was 17, 17. Yeah. A long time ago. And, um, I was running through the show hall until I realized like, there's nothing around me. I had run into a part of the hall that nobody was in. I had no idea where I was, but I just started walking back. And as I'm walking, I'm looking at my sweater and there's like pieces missing from it. And then you Ooh. get that kind of shaky, cold, sweaty, something bad just happened feeling. Right. And yeah, so a bunch of people had had tackled him and that's how he stopped. But I didn't even know. I was just running. You know, when people talk about that fight or flight, I'm a I'm a flight. I don't have any fight in me. I'm going to run. <laughs> run, run so. I mean, thank God you didn't get bit, though. I did. Oh, I oh, did. You, you I got, did. Yeah. I got ear, neck. I got uh, this hand, the back of this arm, a little bit out of my tricep. So you could see the pattern where I turn to run. And then on my back, there's a little little mark. So, no, I got I got 
I got bit. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So did that change your decision then on doing the dog bakery? Well, you know, it's funny because at the time I was 17, I had just graduated high school, was in my freshman quarter at Auburn University, and I was a small animal veterinary medicine student. That's what I was going to do. And it absolutely changed my, I was like, nope, can't do that anymore. Don't know what I'm going to do, but it's not going to be that. And I was very fearful of animals. And, you know, I had dogs. I had a cat. I sent everything home to my mom and dad because I couldn't be around them. And it was probably a couple of years, if memory serves, before I was able to bring my cat back. But it was, that was 87. It was 95 and we got chili. So it was, it was several years before I was able to have a dog again. Um, and Chili's the one who really started me like getting back into opening my brain up that it's okay. You know, this, this happened, but not all dogs are bad. And that was situational. And, you know, there was one thing where there are so many things your brain goes, that could have happened differently. That could have happened differently. And he was a new dog with us. And so there were a lot of his personality traits that I didn't know yet. So I, it did change my, definitely my uh, thought of what I wanted to do with my life. And that was a er, trajectory that it was a corner right there that I turned in a heartbeat. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, getting back to the pandemic and uh, mental health, you know, that was yeah. a huge topic that really got uh, a lot more attention during that time. But prior to that, we already knew that depression existed, anxiety and suicidal uh, ideation and, and all of those things. But uh, did you go through anything like that during the pandemic? You know, I, I didn't go through that. For me, the it was sort of, so the team, I was still at TBC and I still had my team. And it was basically sort of one of these, like a lot of companies, it was an overnight shift. Overnight, you're home, figure it out. So we did. And so our team had already begun using one of the agile techniques, which is the daily standup. And so we were doing a physical standup. We were all in the office together, but we kept that going with a digital standup every morning at nine. So we still had daily interaction with each other visually. And so that helped throughout the day, staying in touch, those kind of things. So that was very helpful because I did have that social connection with people at work. I also began to coach, to do distance. Co I had never done distance coaching before, but you couldn't be in the, anyone's physical presence. So I started to do some distance coaching and that opened up a lot of opportunity for me because it was also a way to be of service to other people who really needed that support, who it was really challenging to figure out how to get it because you can't, you know, phone call doesn't quite, you know, you need that, that visual, that face to face. Yes. And that was the way to do it. So that did help. But, you know, my husband is here and we had, um, for us, there was also a big gratitude part for me because the pandemic, the timing of it for us personally, it was just odd. So yeah, September 12, 2018, my, our house blew up. So that blew yeah, up. it blew up. So our house, we lived in Palm Beach Gardens and we lived in a corner lot uh, of a community and behind our community was a power line, a big high transmission power line that I never gave two thoughts to, but it ran the length of the community behind our house. And that particular evening, one of the lines just disconnected and on its way to the ground, it grazed the metal chain link fence in our backyard and it electrified the fence and it sent the current from the fence to the screen metal enclosure, of the back porch, up the gutters through the house. And Steve was cooking Oof. and I had just gotten home from work and had changed my clothes and it was like, blue light pop 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 and I was just like get out get out get out so we run out and I couldn't really I still didn't know what had happened but I hear people across the canal in the next neighborhood yelling get away get away get away and I'm I'm hearing them but I don't know what they're talking about so I'm walking toward what I'm hearing and they're like get away get away and I'm like what are you talking about and they're like it's down it's down and I still don't know and finally and I have my phone and I'm like trying to video, I don't know what I'm videotaping. And then I see it. I see the pole with lines. And then this one is blank, but I didn't know where, where to go. Like your brain doesn't process that. Right. And then I see it on, on the ground and I'm like, okay, that's a live wire. We're getting out of here. And it was hours before the fire department and the, the um, police were done. And when they were done, it was very late at night and we didn't really know what to do, but that began almost two years of not having a house, not having a place to live, not having anything. So you got to find an apartment. You got to, it's got to be furnished because you don't have anything. 
Um, you still have to pay mortgage on a house you can't live in. Oh and, my God. Yep. You have to pay mortgage on that, have to work through all that. And it was, it was, it was bad. But at the, you know, by the time we were able to get to mediation with our insurance company, it was no November, December 2019. Well, everything started shutting down in February of 2020. So we literally had gotten to mediation and finalized all of that. And then the world started shutting down and we, you know, had, had basically found a place to live this, this house, but you know, the stuff was still like, everything was gone. We didn't know, but we were here. So at least we had a place to anchor ourselves. No idea what, that that was going to happen. But when it did, the first thing I remember thinking was one of the last apartments we were able to, cause everything had to be short term. We didn't know, you know, how long we would be anywhere. One of the last ones, I was lucky to have it. But the dishwasher, to tell you how old it was, was an RCA brand dishwasher. I didn't even know they made RCA brand dishwashers. So I didn't was, even. Yeah. And I was like, we could have been there. Who knew how long the pandemic was going to last? So I always look back at that as an, a very, very fortunate series of events after a lot of years. And the house blowing up was just one of many hugely catastrophic events. But that dovetailed in it, dovetailing into the pandemic was a real moment of gratitude for me because we could have by just a week or two been in someone else's you know been relying on somebody else throughout that pandemic and who knows what could have happened sure. so i you know i i was always grat- grateful during the pandemic that we had a place to live that was ours again and we could get things for it and then in i think it was it was two years. So it was October, November of that year of 2020 when I knew I was ready for a dog again and being in the house almost, you know, all those months with just me and Steve love my husband, 28 years, but (laughs) yeah, we're a little bored with each other, but I was ready for a dog again. And Newman came home December 13th of that year. So yesterday it was two years to the day. And that absolutely just really changed everything. But I, I I remember just feeling a lot of gratitude going through that, that I had a place to live. I had, you know, pe- loved ones that were safe because the world was in, in chaos and people were not safe. And I just, you know, yeah, I remember being very, very grateful. And it also really made me want to 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 reach out and help other people. And you, you couldn't reach out. You couldn't hug, right? You couldn't do any of those things for people. Yeah. So what do you do? And I just started having more conversations with people. But no, I remember being grateful. You know what? Um, no matter what happens, you know, if you can maintain that state of gratitude, it'll help you get through anything. I mean, yeah. something catastrophic as, as what you went through. Um, I mean, how else do you get through it? <laughs> it's mindset. It, look, yeah. Really, you know, what you, what you tell yourself that you can do, you can do it, but, but being grateful is the place to start because, you know, everybody does that thing where, you know, I'll be happy when, you know, when I get that promotion, when I get that raise, when I get, you know, the house I want, when my kids are grown, whatever it is, but you could be happy right now. And one of the easiest like shortcut paths to happiness is gratitude because you have, you know, when you, you don't think you have until you take note of what you have. And when you take note of it, you realize like, no, I'm pretty, pretty good spot. You know, no matter where, what it is, when you're looking at what you have through that lens, instead of the, what you don't, it, it does make you feel grateful. I do that every morning. I get in the shower and I, I kid you not, Jason, every day when I get in the shower and I turn the water on, I am thankful for hot water because I, you know, and I know I live in Florida. I know you're in a tropical area too. So having been through hurricanes, I know very well what it's like to be without power for a good while. Right. You don't have hot water, but you still need to take a shower, you know, (laughs) because hurricanes happen in the summer and it is a big awakening, you know, and I know some people do that cold thing to rev up their energy, but when you don't have a choice, you don't have hot water. I I make note of being grateful for that every morning I do. Um, But yeah, I think it's mindset. It really is. Yeah, Absolutely. So tell me about your coaching. Um, What kind of uh, coaching do you do exactly with your clients to help them achieve their goals? 
Yeah. So basically what I do is it really is focused on mindset and confidence and one does flow from the other. But with my clients, you know, I want to start, I want to understand where she is right now. So I start with a couple of assessments so that I get a feel for the behaviors that are going on and the mindset that is helping to produce those. Because at the end of the day, you know, we all live at the top of the results pyramid, the results that we're getting, the life that we are living is the result of the actions that we're taking and what, what determines the actions you take your mindset, right? So whatever you think is what you end up doing, but all those things flow from what you basically believe. And so beliefs are habituated thoughts, whatever we've repeatedly, repetitively thought over and over again, from whatever age to now, that becomes our beliefs. We act on those because that's our mindset. So I always start there. So I want to understand like their Enneagram. I want to understand uh, their saboteurs. I want to understand where, you know, their strengths are. And then, and, you know, we'll have that initial conversation of, you know, what's going on, you know, what brought you to me today? You know, where can I help you? And we just kind of start talking there. And then what I find is a lot of times the ask, I want this, or I didn't get, you know, I've been passed over for, for promotion twice and it's make or break. They're either going to recognize my value or I'm quitting. And it's like, okay, let's, let's get into that. Let's really get into that. So what actually ha- what's going on, what happened? And we go through those, but what I try to do is give a wider perspective because a lot of times when people are having conversations about what they don't want, they're having it with people who have the best of intentions. They do. They have the best of intentions. They are their friends. They are their family. They are their loved ones. So they have skin in the game, but in a different way. So they're re- they might be an echo chamber of sorts, reinforcing something that may not be the complete picture. So what I try to do is provide a perspective, a wider perspective, so that everybody can see all the opportunities that are out there all along that we may not have recognized and been able to capitalize on. So a great example is, I had a client and she came, she was that, she was that person. I'm pissed off. I've been there a long time. I'm either quitting or they're going to promote me, but it, I, I can't get passed over again. So we started talking about what was going on. And as it turned out, she had put her hat in the ring for a couple of promotions. She was well qualified for it, but there was one not so in, insignificant piece of information that she wasn't factoring in, which was she had a significant health issue in her family. Her son was very sick. And so naturally, she's mom, she's parent. Any parent, as you know, your attention is there. Right. And even though you're trying, you're showing up every day, you're doing your thing, you're having your meetings, you're having your project, your heart, so your attention is here. And her boss knew that. And he had actually, in hindsight, what we learned through all this, and we invited him in to a couple of sessions. He had been trying to talk to her about their EAP, what they could offer her, how they could support her. But she thought he was being intrusive and didn't want it. And then she thought he was trying to babysit and follow up on her. And she didn't, she didn't want it. And she's talking with people about what's happening, but they're not getting the entire story. And so everyone's reinforcing to her, this is an unfair situation. You're being treated wrongly. Get out, get out, get out. And so at one point I asked her, I said, you know, would it be okay with you if we just invited him? I don't know if he'll come, but we'll invite him for a session or two. Just want to have all three of us talk because she'd been there a long time. She had so much value that she had already brought. And she, again, she'd been there a long time. They knew her, they knew her family. So we got him on the phone. We were talking or on the zoom, we're talking. And it started to become really clear that they had a major communication issue and they're, but they both, you know, had some issues with that. They both were participant in making it happen, but it was basically a way to break that down and have everybody understand that what was actually happening was what they both wanted, but they weren't seeing it because they weren't coming at it from the right perspective. So getting into that really helped. <clears throat> what they were able to do was, you know, help expose her to the opportunities of FMLA and other things that she could tap 
to help herself through this time. And also with the EAP, that she would have access to other support services that would help her as she navigated a very tricky world of, you know, medical providers and, you know, copays and all these specialty things because her son had non, I mean, I want to get it right, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So, which is a certain kind, kind of cancer. Right. Very, very, very tricky stuff. And so it, it ended up being a very good thing, but you know, that for me was one where it could have gone such a different way. And I always told her, I said, I'm really grateful to her for reaching out when she did, because she could have gotten herself into a situation where she would have been so frustrated that she would have left a position and a company that did value her, that had, you know, repeatedly, you know, invested in her with training. She had gotten, you know, good compensation to leave that because of a miscommunication. And so it's that, that listening and talking and hearing and trying to hear everything, not just what we want to hear, you know, not just, you know, that information, you know, confirmation bias that we have that happens through all kinds of ways. So, you know, memory bias, where we remember what we want, you know, hearing bias, we hear what we want, research bias, when we're doing a Google search, you know, like I was saying this the other day, you know, if I want to know why dogs are better than cats, well, test your theory, search why cats are better than dogs. That's a benign example, but it's a good one to understand where we are filtering information to support what we already think, right? As opposed to what may, might actually be happening. And that's difficult. So sometimes you need that extra person to help you do that. Um, so that really is a lot of what I do is getting a lot of information, trying really to get to know the person. And then in in large measure, I sit back and I listen. I want to hear what's happening. I want to hear how it's, how it's impacting you. And what would, what would happen if, what, how would life be different if, what's the ultimate thing we want to get to? And then we work on the, on creating a system, right? A path to achieve that. And that's, that, that's, a, there are a lot of steps in there. So there's new habit forming, there's other things. That's why most of my programs are going to, you know, bottom at 12 weeks, because that's really the length of time where once we've started to arrive at something, now it can take hold. Anything shorter than that. I know for me personally, I'll quit. (laughs) I'll be like that diet or whatever it is. I won't, I won't (laughs) stay with it if it, if I haven't done it for a while. So it becomes part of you after a while. Yeah. Wow. Your, your coaching program sounds phenomenal. And, um, one of the things that stood out for me is that, you know, perspective is so important. I mean, if you have a, a perspective that doesn't line up with where you want to be or, you know, uh, it's affecting your performance on your current job, I mean, it, it, it can be catastrophic. Yes, it can. And it can also lead you not just to, you know, behaviors that may not serve you, but it can decisions that don't serve you in the long run. And, and it's hard because, you know, we are, we live in a very immediate society. If I want something I can get on my phone, text somebody for it or Grubhub it or whatever, and I can have it at my door, you know, quickly. So that patience to let things unfold and give yourself that time to create the situations that are going to bring those opportunities to you because it does happen. But that helping people understand that it's, it's worth the wait. It sounds terrible. Nobody wants to wait for anything, But it's during that grace period, that time where you can create the mechanisms and learn new skills that will get you exactly where you want to go, exactly where you want to go. Yeah. I heard a LinkedIn Live show with you on LinkedIn yesterday with Don Cohen. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, if you're on LinkedIn, please check out this show. How often is it and when is it, Gretchen? So he has graciously invited me to his LinkedIn live. He does one every day, but I usually join him on Mondays. Um, So it's usually Mondays about 11. Um, Next week, we're actually going to do it on Wednesday because he has a conflict on Monday, but it's usually Mondays at 11 Eastern time US. Yeah. Okay. That's great. And how can people find you on social media? Yeah, so I'm on LinkedIn. Gretchen Skalka uh, is my name, and welcome to look me up there. I'm on YouTube. I have a YouTube channel that I'm trying to start. <laughs> As I think you know, I've just recently gotten over a phobia of video, but um, so really, there I'm. I'm. I, I'm not really on Instagram or TikTok or any of the fun ones. Um, not uh, Facebook. I don't really understand that much. So it's really LinkedIn and YouTube. <laughs> so yeah, I'm old school. 
Okay, <laughs> awesome. I mean, for what you want to do, LinkedIn is the place to be. It is. It is. I have found that the the most of the people that I can support and serve in some way do happen to be on LinkedIn. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Gretchen, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, I will definitely be back in touch with you and I would love to have you back. I would love to come back. I'm Again, I'm grateful to you for inviting me here today. This has been so much fun. I love talking to you, Jason. <laughs> yeah, same here. Same here. Uh, Thanks, Gretchen. Take care. Thank you. All, All right. right. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you for watching Victory Circle Podcast. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel.